Okay, knit nurses, this is Lisa. I have a podcast on oxygenation, and our presentation today is actually coming from Chapter 15 and Chapter 32. Chapter 15 is the one about vital signs. So our student learning outcomes are to describe factors that cause variation in temperature and nursing intervention to manage abnormal ranges. Describe factors that cause variation in pulse and blood pressure and nursing interventions to manage abnormal ranges. Describe factors that cause variation in respiration and oxygen saturation and nursing interventions to manage abnormal findings. Explain the physiological processes of ventilation, perfusion, and cellular respiration. Safely administer oxygen with prescribed oxygen administration devices, which we did in lab and you'll do in clinical. Differentiate methods to mobilize pulmonary secretions and differentiate mechanisms of heat loss, including radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation. So this presentation starts out with a video, which I will expect you to watch and to be able to understand the difference between radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation. So we know in our bodies that heat loss and production occur at the same time. The exposure of skin to the environment results in a constant normal heat loss through radiation. So we give off heat to surrounding objects without physical contact. Heat transfers from the blood through vessel walls closer to the surface of the skin and is lost to the environment through the heat loss mechanism of radiation. Convection transfers heat in the air uh, and airflow through the use of a fan promotes heat loss. So if you think about a fire stove inside a house, how the fire heats up the stove and then the stove gives, gives off the heat. Evaporation is where liquid converts to vapor, so like diaphoresis or sweating, that helps cool the body by evaporation. And then conduction is when warmth transfers to a cool object by direct contact. So the video talks about when you pour a hot cup of coffee and then you touch the cup to warm up, that warms up your hands when you touch that a uh, hot cup of coffee, so that is conduction. In the body, when we need to, when the body needs to conserve heat, we will have vasoconstriction uh, at the skin level. And so that vasoconstriction at the skin level will help conserve heat into the body. And when, at times when we need to be, cool the body off, so when we're hot, when we're working out and sweating, we have vasodilation near the skin and that will help the body lose more heat from that radiation. The control for our temperature regulation is really happening in the hypothalamus. And when the hypothalamus recognizes that the temperature is increasing, that is what controls that vaso vasodilation and sweating. So it widens the blood vessels to increase blood flow to the skin and promote heat loss uh, by radiation and starts to make us sweat. So we, that's evaporation. And when the hypothalamus uh, notices that we need to get warmer, it will cause vasoconstriction or shivering. Um, narrowing of the blood vessels and that shivering muscle um, can sometimes help us create heat production that we need inside of our bodies. So the true fever results from an alteration in the hypothalamus. Substances that trigger the immune system such as viruses, um, and illnesses, bacteria, stimulate the release of hormones in an effort to promote bodily defense against infection. These hormones also trigger the hypothalamus to raise the set point of temperature, which induces a febrile episode. 
pyrogens. So a pyrogen is something that causes a fever. And we know children often have fevers that are caused by viruses. Their immature immune systems mean the temperatures can rise quickly and to dangerous levels. Interventions for children's fevers are based on the response to the illness and not on the temperature level itself. So that means we're looking at signs and symptoms of what's going on with the individual patient. The increased heart rate, which is due to an increased metabolism, and that sympathetic nervous system response that results in vasodilation and dehydration. There's decreased urinary output due to dehydration and sweating. There's thirst due to dehydration and sweating. There's a headache often due to the vasodilation and dehydration, and hot, dry skin or a flushed face due to vasodilation and dehydration. And then we have general malaise. So especially for kids, when we're looking at uh, feverish kids, we're looking at more of these signs and symptoms rather than just the number of the temperature. When it comes to fever patterns, um, we do look at assess for those when a febrile episode occurs. Patterns may be sustained, intermittent, remittent, or relapsing. A sustained fever has a body temperature continuously above 104, uh, I'm sorry, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius that demonstrates little fluctuation. An intermittent fever has fever spikes of high temperature mixed with usual temperature levels. Temperature returns to acceptable value at least once in 24 hours. A remittent fever spikes and falls without a return to acceptable temperature levels. So notice the difference between intermittent and remittent. So intermittent returns to acceptable normal value at least once a day. Remittent goes up and down, but never really comes down to an acceptable or normal level. A relapsing fever has periods of febrile episodes mixed with acceptable temperature values. Febrile episodes and periods of normothermia or normal temperature that are sometimes longer than 24 hours. I'm going to talk about blood pressure for a minute, and I'm not sure exactly how much you get in your health assessment class. So I want to talk about factors that influence blood pressure. We know that age affects blood pressure, that remember our vessels uh, lose elasticity as we age, so that can increase blood pressure. When we look at gender, it's typical that after um, puberty, men have higher blood pressures than women, but during and after menopause, women have higher blood pressures than men. Ethnicity affects blood pressure. Uh, hypertension is higher in African Americans. And sympathetic stimulation, pain, anxiety, fear, all of those that stimulate the sympathetic nervous system can cause the blood pressure to increase. So if you have a patient who constantly has these emotions, you can expect that they may have a high blood pressure. Medication can affect blood pressure. Some uh, medications can raise it. Some are obviously are antihypertensives and they decrease blood pressure. Activity can increase blood pressure. Sometimes eating can lower blood pressure. Obesity is a risk factor for hypertension. And um, sometimes a diet lower in sodium can reduce blood pressure. Smoking is something that does increase blood pressure because it causes vasoconstriction, which narrows the blood vessels, and then that can increase blood pressure. 
Okay, so orthostatic hypotension, I know we've talked about that before, and you do talk about that in health assessment. Uh, but remember, we had see sometimes that drop of blood pressure when rising to a more upright position because peripheral blood vessels are already constricted or unable to constrict uh, when, when the position changes due either to decreased blood volume or dehydration or anemia sometimes from antihypertensive medications or prolonged uh, lying down or supine position. The other thing I, I'm not sure if you talk about in uh, health assessment is what's called an auscultory gap. Sometimes when you're checking a blood pressure, you'll hear those um, beats in your stethoscope and then you'll kind of hear a period of nothing and then it will pick back up um, as, as the sphygmomanometer decreases. So um, it's important to be complete listening to that when you're checking a blood pressure for a patient. Okay, so we're going to move to oxygenation at this point. And the first thing I want to talk about is the difference between ventilation, diffusion, respiration, and perfusion. So ventilation is the actual breathing of the body. The lungs expand, the lungs uh, um, contract and air is moving in and out of the lungs. That is ventilations, uh, ventilation. It is controlled from uh, a neuro source as well as chemical source. So the body is kind of measuring the oxygen and the carbon dioxide and um, sending a signal to breathe. And that also happens within the nervous system as well. Diffusion uh, is the movement of gases between air spaces and the bloodstream as the blood flows around the alveoli, allowing for diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide across the alveolar capillary membrane. So diffusion is that actual uh, um, exchange diffusion of the oxygen and carbon dioxide. Respiration is the um, general term for that exchange or diffusion of carbon dioxide and oxygen during cellular metabolism. And perfusion is the movement of blood into and out of the lungs to the organs and tissues of the body. Those are some important terms. So just a review of the anatomy and physiology of the pulmonary system. The right lung is made up of three lobes, the upper, middle, and lower lobes. The left lung has two lobes, the upper and lower lobes. The left lung only has two lobes because the heart is tucked just a little bit to the left uh, in our chest. The trachea enters the thorax and bifurcates or branches out into the right and left main stem bronchus. The bronchi branch into smaller and smaller bronchioles similar to a tree. The last branch of the airways ends at the exchanging unit of the lung, the alveoli. The alveoli are lined with surfactant, which prevents the alveoli from collapsing on expiration. Successful ventilation depends on neural regulation involving the central nervous system, which sends signal to the chest wall musculature to control ventilation rate, depth, and rhythm. Chemical regulation involves the influence of chemicals such as carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions, which affect the rate and depth of ventilation. Uh, successful ventilation de also depends on lung elasticity. The delivery of oxygen depends on the amount of oxygen entering the lungs from the atmosphere. There's about 20% of oxygen in the normal air that we breathe. Once oxygen has reached the alveoli, diffusion occurs. Oxygen crosses the alveolar capillary membrane and is dissolved into the plasma. It then moves into red blood cells and binds with hemoglobin molecules. 
Hemoglobin transports most oxygen and serves as a carrier for both oxygen and carbon dioxide. Perfusion of oxygenated blood occurs in the capillary beds of the organs and tissues. At the capillary level, carbon dioxide diffuses from the cells into the plasma. Once the carbon dioxide is transported by venous blood to the lungs, diffusion occurs again. Carbon dioxide is highly soluble and it quickly crosses the gas membrane into the alveoli and through ventilation, the carbon dioxide is expelled from the lungs into the atmosphere. Some alterations of the pulmonary system are hypoxia, hypoxemia, hypoventilation, and hyperventilation. Hypoxia is inadequate tissue oxygen with deficiency of oxygen delivery or oxygen utilization. Signs and symptoms are mild increase in pulse and respiration, vasoconstriction, so think about what vasoconstriction could do to blood pressure, dizziness, confusion, and severe chain stokes or apnea. So that chain stokes would be kind of <sighs> and then a stopping and kind of repeating of that cycle of increasing breathing, decreasing breathing, and periods of stopping. And then apnea, of course, would be uh, absence of respiration. Causes of hypoxia could be decreased ability to carry oxygen like anemia or carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, high altitude, COPD, uh, uh, central nervous system depression, which can be caused by medications, think uh, too much morphine, or trauma. Hypoxemia is abnormal deficiency of oxygen in the blood. Signs and symptoms would be tachypnea, dyspnea, so tachypnea, would be fast breathing. Dyspnea would be irregular or abnormal breathing. Pallor, cyanosis, headache all the way to confusion, lethargy, hyperreactive reflexes, or coma. Causes would be decreased diffusion of oxygen from the lung. So pneumonia, atelectasis, so something's blocking it, uh, or shunting of blood to the left side of the heart without exchange of gas in the lungs, which can happen in ventricular fibrillation or asystole. Uh, hypoventilation is not enough breathing to meet demand. So that can be caused by trauma or pain. Something has affected the nervous system regulation of breathing or collapse of alveoli, which usually would be from trauma or severe atelectasis. Remember, atelectasis is um, when... So remember that atelectasis is that collapse of alveoli. Hyperventilation is an increase in respiratory rate which causes excessive carbon dioxide buildup. Signs and symptoms are shortness of breath, tachycardia, tachypnea, uh, lightheaded, decreased concentration, blurred vision, disorientation. Um, so the cause could be severe anxiety, but also infection, fever, head injury, or would all be causes of hyperventilation. So if we're looking at alterations of the circulatory system, um, we can see um, problems with oxygenation not just originating in the lungs, but also within the circulatory system. So cardiac output. So if you have decreased cardiac output, that is a failure of the myocardium or the heart to eject sufficient blood volume uh, from the systemic and pulmonary circulations resulting in heart failure. And we'll bring heart failure up again in just a little bit. Myocardial ischemia, 
is what happens when the coronary arteries, so the coronary arteries are the arteries in the heart muscle, um, they do not supply sufficient blood to the heart muscle, resulting in chest pain, especially with activity. So think ischemia is not enough uh, blood into the heart muscle. Angina or angina pectoris is the result of decreased blood flow to the myocardium as a result of coronary artery spasms or temporary constriction. Angina is uh, usually temporary. Myocardial, myocardial infarction is decreased myocardial blood perfusion. It is extensive or perfusion is completely blocked. So the heart muscle tissue becomes necrotic or dies and an infarction occurs and presents clinically as severe or crushing chest pain, jaw pain, left arm pain, breathlessness, diaphoresis, and hypotension. It can also present as shortness of breath, nausea, and vomiting. So you don't necessarily have these classic symptoms. Valvular heart disease is an acquired or congenital disorder of cardiac valves characterized by stenosis, or think hardening, which results in obstructed blood flow or valvular degeneration and regurgitation of blood, which results in backflow of blood causing either pulmonary or systemic congestion. Left-sided heart failure is characterized by impaired functioning of the left ventricle due to an increased preload or volume, fluid volume overload, increased afterload, so somehow the systemic vascular resistance, such as having uh, high blood pressure, is significant, resulting in decreased cardiac output or pulmonary congestion. And so if you have pulmonary congestion, you should hear crackles, complaints, a patient will complain of fatigue, dyspnea, orthopnea, so difficulty breathing while lying down. So left, think of left-sided heart failure as the blood does not get pumped out fast enough, pumped out of the heart fast enough, and backs up into the blood backs up into the lungs. Right-sided heart failure results from impaired functioning of the right ventricle, which is typically caused by pulmonary disease or pulmonary hypertension, or from untreated or unstaged left-sided heart failure. An increase in pressure in the pulmonary system causes increased resistance in the right ventricle. The right ventricle fails as a result of this pressure. The patient then develops venous congestion in the systemic circulation and on assessment, you often identify distended jugular veins and peripheral edema. So think of right-sided heart failure as the blood doesn't get into the right side of the heart fast enough. So now the blood is backing up into the body. Hypovolemia is a reduced circulating blood volume resulting from extracellular fluid loss that occurs in conditions such as shock or severe dehydration. Hypovolemia obviously can also be caused by trauma. If fluid loss is significant, the body tries to adapt by increasing the heart rate and constricting peripheral vessels to increase volume of blood returned to the heart and cardiac output. A dysrhythmia is a disturbance in the electrical impulse of the heart rhythm, and they are classified by their site of origin and their cardiac response. So at this point, as a foundation student, you should know that dysrhythmias exist, but you will learn more about reading rhythm strips later on in the program. What I want you to know about rhythms for the heart um, really are just rhythms that often cause us to do uh, need CPR. And so uh, one example of that could be ventricular fibrillation. So that's chaotic rhythm of the um, ventricula. Um, 
sometimes ventricular tachycardia can cause us to need CPR. We hear a lot about atrial fibrillation. However, that does not always require CPR. In fact, often does not. Um, and so just be aware of those things. There are some times when other rhythms can cause the need for CPR, but you'll learn more about that later on in the program. For cardiac circulation, I expect us to talk more about this in class. There's a video here that you could watch, um, but just to talk it out, blood comes in through the vena cava into the right atrium, goes into the left ventricle, then to the pulmonary artery, then to the lungs, then to the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium, to the left ventricle, to the aorta, and out to the rest of the body. So factors affecting oxygenation. Um, if we talk about, uh, there's a big long list of them. So increase in metabolic activity of the body, increase oxygen demand. Oxygen levels fall when the body is unable to meet an increased oxygen demand. So when we have increased metabolic activity, examples would be during pregnancy, wound healing, anxiety, exercise, fever, all increase the need of the tissues for oxygen. Increased carbon dioxide or hypercapnia increases the rate and depth of respiration to eliminate excess carbon dioxide. Can result in hypoxemia, um, decrease oxygen carrying capacity. If you think about how would you find that out? What carries oxygen in the blood, right? Hemoglobin. Uh, decrease inspired oxygen concentration. So remember that oxygen is 20% on room air. But if you have a decreased environmental oxygen due to high altitude or some type of obstruction in the airway or a decreased delivery of inspired oxygen, there's some type of mass or something that's blocking the oxygen. Condition that reduces chest wall movement can decrease ventilation. So that would be decreased ventilation, hypoventilation, positioning. So lying or stooped or slumped over. So if you think of uh, the little lady with lordosis, um, uh, that can definitely prevent lung expansion. The diaphragm is unable to move fully. Um, other musculoskeletal issues would be abnormal structural shapes or muscle disease that contribute to decreased oxygenation. Smoking also decreases the elasticity of the alveoli. Nervous system diseases, again, like myasthenia gravis, ALS. Trauma, uh, damage to the spinal cord affects respiration. Um, the phrenic nerve is the one that really goes to the diaphragm. Uh, or, uh, um, I'm sorry, cervical trauma to C3 to C5 results in paralysis of the phrenic nerve, thus it's going to affect the diaphragm. Um, paradoxical breathing, in which the lung underlying the injured area contracts on inspiration and expands on expiration. So that would ma be, make that ventilation ineffective. And if you think about a person with surgery, incisional pain causes patients to inhale slow, uh, more shallowly shallowly, and that decreases chest wall movement. Some medication can depress or increase respiratory rates. Um, anemia, so nutrition, might be affected, uh, might create anemia. Hydration, cigarette smoking or substance abuse, um, exercise and stress. Environmental factors, air pollution, uh, occupational or environmental uh, exposures. So I know you're learning a lot about respiratory assessment in your health assessment class.
But I want to point out that in your fundamentals textbook, page 877, there's a great box 32.2 that has a great list of questions to ask patients when you're assessing uh, their respiratory status. Um, you're also going to make sure that you ask about their medications and realize that the older adult considerations that you might need to include some cognitive status, um, things like that, uh, and recognizing that their respiratory status is not going to be the same as that of a 20 year old. Uh, you're also going to be looking at fingertips, colors, um, looking for cyanosis, what type of breathing, jugular vein distension, um, and I think you're probably learning about that in health assessment. Um, I did want to mention diagnostic tests that you would be looking for, and I know we've talked about some already, one including a pulse ox or O2 saturation. Uh, and that comes in a percentage. You even might do what you've had uh, to be in nursing school, a TB test that could uh, be considered an assessment for the respiratory status as well. There are other lab tests for respiratory um, assessment, including blood gases, but you're going to learn more about those when you move up into the program. Um, uh, respiratory patterns, so tachypnea, bradypnea, apnea, Kussmaul, chain stokes. Uh, I believe you're learning about those in health assessment as well. Nursing diagnoses that um, we can use for respiratory issues could be activity intolerance, ineffective airway clearance, ineffective breathing patterns, decreased cardiac output, so that would be an oxygenation issue, fatigue, impaired gas exchange, risk for infection, ineffective peripheral tissue perfusion. And when we're talking about nursing actions, we can do some things to prevent issues with oxygenation. So a good example of that would be vaccination or environmental modification. Sometimes people get their homes tested and they have a high carbon monoxide level um, and they need to get their furnace checked, things like that. Um, helping with diet and exercise. So if a patient has obesity and that's causing an issue for oxygenation. We can help them with nutrition and a plan for that. Um, again, um, care of the older adult. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. That was box 32.5. Other things that nurses can do, a uh, thing we can implement actions for oxygenation would be oxygen. And um, you will be getting a handout that will talk about uh, how much about equate the percentage of oxygen with how many liters that you're putting up on the wall. And um, so that can be helpful for a lot of people. We do need to be careful for our patients with COPD because they what drives them to breathe is different than what drives us to breathe if we don't have COPD and if we give them too much oxygen that can be a, a signal to their system that they don't need to breathe and so we do need to make sure that we're giving them oxygen in smaller amounts uh, those patients with COPD Um, just remembering our safety precautions with oxygen, really encouraging the patient, no smoking around the oxygen. Um, we don't want to use any petroleum products uh, right around the patient because petroleum is oil, which is flammable. And so just keeping an eye on those types of things. We can humidify the oxygen when people are on oxygen for long periods of time. Um, that humidity can make them more comfortable. 
We can use suctioning techniques. We can also teach different types of coughing. And so um, we'll talk more about this in class, uh, the cascade, huff, quad cough. Um, we talked about suctioning in lab. We can also uh, have patients on CPAP or BiPAP. Um, CPAP and BiPAP are often used for people with sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is a problem that a lot of people have and it's really becoming recognized as uh, a cause of sequelae or consequences that can lead to other problems. And so um, you'll see there are actually a lot of people getting more and more common to be on CPAP or BiPAP at home for sleep apnea. We can also talk about uh, positioning for lung expansion and scent of spirometry, which I know we've talked about, chest physiotherapy um, as um, basically you're banging on the back and or chest to help break up secretions in the lungs. Um, breathing exercises, we definitely can talk to patients about that. Um, and that is just the purse lip breathing or um, talking about um, concentrating on the diaphragm, increasing the, expanding the chest to get that lung expansion that a lot of people just, they just don't think about. And then we have, um, uh, I'm sorry, then we have uh, nebulizer treatments or, or blood, I'm sorry, breathing treatments. Um, sometimes these are done by respiratory therapists, but they can also be done by the nurse in some facilities. And that will deliver medication that will help open the lungs and uh, open, get those um, alveoli open so that gas exchange can help. So obviously when we're evaluating our interactions or interventions for the patient, we're looking at the goals and did we meet the goals and outcomes uh, for the patient. And remember if um, we didn't, then we're going circling right back to assessment. So that's it for oxygenation.